Chapter 6 When the others had been excused to go out for mid-morning play, John had to go and stand by Miss Plimsoll's desk. John, Miss Plimsoll said, you mustn't make up silly stories to excuse your failures. I must have the truth. What did you do with your pencil? This is it, John said, showing Miss Plimsoll the pointed stick of chocolate. Really, it is. It's changed. What do you mean it's changed? Miss Plimsoll demanded. That's my pencil, John tried to explain. Only it isn't the same anymore. Nothing stays the same today. If I put it into my mouth. The same thing happened when I chewed my gloves. They were chocolate, too. John, said Miss Plimso slowly, do you feel all right? Yes, thank you, John said. I feel all right, except, he added, I'm getting so thirsty. The water from the water fountain turned to chocolate, and so did the water upstairs. I would like a drink of cold water. Yes, John, Miss Plimso said. She suddenly looked pale. You run out and play with the others. I'm going to have a talk with the nurse. And John, Miss Plimso said, as he started toward the classroom door, here's another pencil. Be a good boy and try not to lose it. I'm afraid I'll have to keep this piece of chocolate until school's out. You know we don't allow anyone to eat candy in class. Miss Plimsoll put the slightly chewed chocolate pencil in her desk drawer, and John went out to look for Susan. He found her skipping rope with two girls in his class. John usually scorned skipping rope. He preferred hide-and-seek, tag, FBI, and spies, kick the can, or any other good, exciting game. Jumping up and down in one place just to avoid being hit by a rope seemed silly to him, but he was sorry for having spoiled Susan's silver dollar, and he was willing to make a sacrifice. Susan, he said, Susan continued to bounce on one foot as her two friends swung the rope over and under, over and under, over and under her. She didn't seem to notice John. I'll skip with you, he offered. Susan stopped, and the rope was caught by her shins. Let's try doubles, backwards, she said, but not to John. She ignored John. You go first, Betty. Ellen, you go second. I'll go last. The one who does it the most times gets the first slice of my birthday cake. Susan looked at John, raised her eyebrows, shut her eyes, and stuck out the tip of her pink tongue. Then she turned back to the girls and smiled. Ellen whispered in Betty's ear, and Betty whispered in Susan's ear. Then all three of them looked at John and at each other again and burst out laughing. Oh, Susan, John protested. I didn't mean to do it. The trouble is, there's something magic about me today. Everything I put into my mouth turns to chocolate. The girls giggled. You wouldn't like it, said John, who was beginning to feel sorrier for himself than he had ever felt before. I think it's getting worse, he added reproachfully. At first, just part, just the part in my mouth turned to chocolate. But when I nibbled the end of my pencil, the whole pencil changed. Pooh, said, Susan said. The others hooted with glee. Maybe I'll get sick and die, John warned. Maybe I'll turn to chocolate myself. Then you'll be sorry. I don't believe one word about the chocolate, Susan said. And if it was true... You'd be glad, because all you ever like eating is chocolate. If you don't believe me, John retorted. 
Just give me that sip, that skipping rope, and I'll prove it. The girls looked questioningly at each other for an instant, but as they hesitated, the bell rang and it was time to go back to the classroom. The rest of the morning passed slowly for John. He was afraid that his mother was going to be cross about the missing gloves. She might not accept the excuse that he had eaten them. He regretted his messed up arithmetic test. He was sad about Susan's anger and disbelief, and he was getting terribly thirsty. Once during geography and once during art, he was excused to get a drink of water. Both times, however, he swallowed nothing but sweet chocolate. His mouth was getting stickier and sweeter and drier by the minute.